Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, He is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, These are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? May God add his blessing to this word. Please be seated. As Americans, we have a complicated relationship with authority, don't we? We celebrate strong leaders like George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, but our very start as a nation was based on rejecting the authority of King George. And we bristle at being told what to do, don't we? At submitting to authority. We love the rugged individualist who plays by his own rules. For example, a DEA officer once stopped at a ranch in Texas. He was talking with the old rancher, and he said, I need to inspect your ranch for illegally grown drugs. The rancher said, okay, but uh, don't go into that field over there. The DEA officer exploded. Buddy, I have the authority of the federal government with me. He reached into his rear pants pocket, pulled out his badge, proudly displayed it to the rancher. See this badge? This badge means I'm allowed to go wherever I want, on any land. No questions asked, no answers given. Have I made myself clear? The rancher nodded politely, apologized, and went about his chores. The DEA officer made a beeline for that field. Short time later, the old rancher heard some screaming. He looked up and he saw the DEA officer running for his life, being chased across the field by the rancher's huge and angry bull. With every step, the bull was gaining ground. The rancher threw down his tools, ran to the fence, and yelled at the top of his lungs, your badge, show him your badge. (laughs) There are different kinds of authority, aren't there? Some people have authority based on their position, Others, it's based on their skill or their character. Some people flaunt their authority. Others use their authority with confidence and humility. And some people's authority is based on bull. 
Jesus talks here about shepherds and sheep and gates, but he's really talking about leadership and authority. You know, shepherd was a common figure of speech for leaders in the ancient Middle East. Raising sheep was a very major business, and so most people were familiar with shepherds and what they did. Of course, King David was literally a shepherd as a boy, and he's the one who wrote, the Lord is my shepherd. God even referred to himself as a shepherd in many places, and he called the leaders of his people shepherds also. And the kings of other nations also picked up on the metaphor, referring to themselves as shepherds. It was a blend of humility, although often false humility, and authority. Shepherds had low status in society, but they were idealized for caring for their sheep. Actually, a number of the commentaries point out that when Jesus flips to talking about, I am the gate, often a sh- the shepherd would sleep across the opening of the sheep pen to protect it. And so in many ways, the shepherd was the gate to the pen. And of all animals, I think sheep are among those that most need leading, aren't they? But as Jesus points out, they follow their shepherd. So it's clear why kings would want to use that image. And Jesus knew, and his audience knew also, that we are all following someone. We're all under authority in our nation, in the workplace, in the church. We're all under the authority of others in what we believe as well. Even people who might call themselves skeptics or free thinkers are accepting others' authority. There's not one of us that has tested every scientific principle in the world. I'm willing to bet that none of you has tested that the sun is 96 million miles away. You believe that because somebody credible, like a teacher, told it to you, and you confirmed it through trustworthy sources that you read. Or somebody believes that the earth is flat because they trust YouTube videos and bloggers more than centuries of scientific study and proofs. But you know, you didn't come up with the philosophy or theology that you believe either. You trusted certain people, and you put yourself under their leadership and their ideas that they have passed on. And Jesus is actually talking with the religious leaders of his day in this passage. The Pharisees were the religious conservatives of their day, people who were honored for their commitment to God and to his law. Most people in Galilee and Judea trusted them. They had authority because of their position, but also because of their knowledge of the law, because of the traditions around it that they were aware of, because of how scrupulously they tried to follow it. And so most people submitted themselves to their authority and to their teaching. But Jesus is drawing a contrast, a contrast between himself and the Pharisees and other leaders. In fact, with all other leaders, he claims to be the only true, good shepherd. And of course, that's an astonishingly arrogant statement. If you find somebody who says that you should follow him and only him, that person is a pretty good chance that he's starting a cult. You should kind of keep away from him. And the people listening knew that. Right at the end of this passage, they're saying, he's demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? Except, as others pointed out that day, Jesus wasn't a lunatic. He spoke in riddles, but he was incredibly sane and composed, even as he called out the corruption of the leaders. He wasn't starting a movement where he got all the wealth and women. He didn't direct his followers to take control through violence or to kill themselves or to do something else destructive. 
In fact, he told them to turn the other cheek. He healed the sick. He welcomed outcasts who had nothing to offer him. So as we look at what he said that day, I'd like us to consider why it is that we should accept Jesus' authority and how he tells us to do so. First, why we should accept his authority is because Jesus doesn't seek his own benefit. He characterizes the Pharisees as thieves and robbers. And at another time, he criticized them for seeking to elevate themselves. In Luke, he said, Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Their love, their motivation, was to get the places of honor. Their motivation was to have others defer to their authority. And, you know, of course, there's no shortage today of people trying to get positions of authority for their own benefit. Honor, praise, awards and interviews, retweets and likes. It's easy to find people who are in leadership, even in the church, just to line their own pockets. I think there are probably better ways to go about doing that, but you will find those people. It's easy to find people who are in leadership, even in the church, to make a name for themselves. But whether it's through charisma or deception, guile or bombast or violence, Jesus says that seeking one's own benefit is not the mark of a true shepherd. Instead, Jesus seeks our benefit. He calls his sheep by name. He knows your name. More than that, he knows the circumstances of your life better than you do. And he cares. He loves you and me more than we could possibly know. And Jesus says that his sheep will follow his voice. You know, this is actually what sheep do, especially in the Middle East and the way that shepherds work there. They would often put their flocks together in one protected enclosure during the night. And then in the morning, each shepherd would call to his sheep and his own flock would come out of the pen toward him. They wouldn't follow other shepherds, just their own. And there's a story that during World War I, A shepherd in the Middle East heard a commotion, ran out and found a group of soldiers driving his flock of sheep away. Presumably they were going to kill and eat them. The shepherd knew there was no way he could stand up to those soldiers. But he called out to his sheep. And they turned around and began moving toward him. And no matter what the soldiers did, the sheep wouldn't listen to them. They couldn't make the sheep go with them. And so the sheep returned to their shepherd because he had called them by name and they knew his voice. Jesus calls us by name. And he protects and unifies his flock. Jesus says that the true shepherd will protect the flock from thieves and wolves, from all of those who would seek to steal and kill and destroy. He says he had other sheep, but there would be one flock with one shepherd, hinting here that Gentiles would be welcomed into his flock. That doesn't mean that we'll always agree, or that there is just one true denomination within the church, but there should be an underlying unity among those who truly belong to Jesus because we belong to Jesus, above everything else. I don't know about you, but I've, I've met some people before and just felt there was some kind of connection there, and I didn't know what it was until I started talking to them a little more and realized, oh, you belong to him too. He provides protection, He unifies the flock, and he provides life to the full. 
You know, a lot of people want to see Christianity as kind of a killjoy. It's just a list of don'ts. You know, that's actually the Pharisees' influence, the tendency of people to focus on religion and rules instead of relationship. But Jesus said that he came so that those who follow him may have life, and life abundantly, life to the full. Now, that doesn't mean that we can just do whatever we want. In the book of Judges, something that punctuates a, a, that downward spiral of chaos and destruction is the refrain, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Israel's king, first and foremost, was supposed to follow God and to lead the people toward him. But when we fail to follow God's leadership, when we just do what's right in our own eyes, that's sin. And as Paul writes in Romans, quoting from Proverbs, the wages of sin is death. But life properly governed by God is life the way it was meant to be. Life that allows us to flourish in the gifting and the joy that he has given us. Life that frees us from selfishness and pride to be able to love one another genuinely. Life that releases us from the stress and the strain of trying to prove ourselves. Allowing us to rest in Jesus' completed work. It's life in the presence of our creator, our father, our savior, and our friend. And really the greatest reason to accept Jesus' authority is the way he defines himself as the good shepherd. He lays down his life for the sheep. He lays down his life as a sacrifice. David was noteworthy as a shepherd for taking on bears and lions to protect his sheep. That was kind of going above and beyond. But nobody would expect a shepherd to sacrifice himself for the sheep. Sheep were the sacrifices. They were taken to the temple, killed, and sacrificed on the altar in the place of people as a substitute for sin. They were a reminder that sin is death, that cutting yourself off from the very source of life leads to death. But of course, a sheep didn't have the same value as a person, so you had to keep sacrificing sheep to cover your sins. But here Jesus says that the shepherd is sacrificing himself for the sheep. there's another distinction that Jesus makes, another claim to uniqueness. He lays down his life voluntarily. He says, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Now, some of the Jewish leaders misunderstood that earlier and thought he was talking about killing himself, but that's not it at all. When he emphasizes he's laying his life down, that he has authority to do so, He's indicating that there's something different going on here. Paul writes in the book of Romans, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Someone might die to save another person's life. But if she does that, she's just changing the timing of her own death. She was going to die anyway. All of us are. None of us can choose whether or not we're going to die. It's inevitable. But what Jesus is emphasizing is that he is the only person who could truly choose to lay down his life because he didn't have to. He came down, the eternal, immortal Son of God, came down from heaven to die in our place. Not because he had to, 
not because he deserved to, not because he was just changing the timing of his own death, but because he chose to. He wanted to because of his love for you and for me. And he said he would take his life up again. That, in fact, is the seal on Jesus' authority and his leadership. Because despite what a lot of nations would have people believe, dead people can't lead. We, I never actually went through the mausoleum on Tiananmen Square, even though I was there a couple of times, to see Chairman Mao's body laid out there. Um, I know some people talked about doing the, the frozen dictators tour. You know, they'd go and see Mao, see Stalin, kind of go and, and visit all those places. Dead people can still have influence. You might do something to honor the memory or the wishes of someone who has died. A person's will might influence what happens to their former possessions. But it's not healthy if it's even truly possible to look to a dead person to lead the living. Dead people don't know what's happening now. They can't adapt to changing circumstances. They can't lead. Jesus could not be the shepherd of the sheep if he stayed dead. His example could inspire us. His teachings could provide us some guidance, but he could not be present to actually lead us if he were dead. But because of the resurrection, because he did take his life up again, he carries the greatest authority. He stands alone among all the other leaders throughout human history. He holds the keys to death and hell, and he gives us hope in our own resurrection, that we can be raised like him. But if Jesus does, in fact, hold the highest authority, if he's deserving of it, and if we recognize that we should accept it, how do we do that? How do we accept his authority? The first thing that's very important is to recognize bad shepherds first indication that Jesus gives to us is that we should be able to spot the thieves and the robbers and the hired hands, those who don't truly care for the sheep, who don't follow Jesus, and we should not follow them. We need to evaluate our leaders, especially those within the church, but also in politics and business and popular culture, and discern who deserves to be followed? Do they seek their own glory or position or profit? Or are they seeking to lift up Jesus and to care for the people they lead? Do they use religion as a tool to gain power? Or do they humble themselves as those who are under a greater authority? Does what they teach and how they lead align with God's word. If not, they're bad shepherds. We need to recognize bad shepherds, and we need to listen to Jesus' voice. You know, a number of years ago, and it was a little disturbing when I tried to think how long ago that actually was, there were bracelets that were popular, especially among teenage Christians. They had WWJD on them. And what did that stand for? Yeah, what would Jesus do? And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying these are, were a bad thing. If they helped people to consider their actions, to grow in holiness, that's good. But, you know, it's occurred to me, they fall short in their message. Because the question, what would Jesus do, presupposes that he's not here. And we have to guess what he would do in our situation. But the truth is far more powerful. Jesus is present with us. Instead of asking, what would Jesus do? We can ask, Jesus, 
what do you want me to do? It probably doesn't make as good of a bracelet. J W D Y W M T D. It kind of run out of room, but but because Jesus took up his life again, he promised to be with those of us who follow him to the end of the age, even today. He is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble, and we can call on him and seek his will day in and day out. But of course, we don't just need to hear his voice. We need to listen to his voice. And everyone who's had kids or has been a kid knows that there's a difference between hearing and listening. We might, as kids, we might hear what our parents say, but that doesn't mean that we actually listen or that the kid is going to do what mom asked him to do. Jesus actually told a parable about that exact thing in Matthew 21. We have to be not only hearers of the word, James said, but also doers. So we need to listen to his voice and we need to follow his lead. Following Jesus means walking in the way that he walks following in his footsteps. So if you would want to follow him, we need to lay down our lives. We can't be a substitute for other people's sins the way Jesus did. But if he laid down his life for us, we should lay our lives down for him. We should submit to him just as he submitted to the Father's will And so we should say also, thy will be done as we pursue lives of holiness and service. We should set aside our own rights for his sake and for the sake of others. And we should be willing to make sacrifices to follow him. We need to lay down our lives before him and we need to care for the other sheep if we're going to follow his lead. If he is our good shepherd, we should be good under shepherds, caring for the others in the flock that he places into our lives. We should give to others as God has given to us, and we should point one another toward him, helping one another to follow him better in love. So do you see the good shepherd today? the one who laid down his life for you. Hear him, calling you by name. Listen to his voice and follow his lead, humbly submitting to him, to his authority, and serving the other sheep in his love.